All right, good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas. Hope it's been a meaningful day so far, spent with friends and family. Welcome to West London Alliance Church on this Christmas morning. Just a couple of announcements to get us started here today. First, if you're a visitor, welcome. Uh, we have a QR code on the screen behind me or in the card in front of you where we'd love to get to know you a bit more. If you'd like to find out a bit more information about some of the ministries that we offer, feel free to scan that and send your information uh, into us. We have a one service next week as well for New Year's Day. And again, it's good practice today because it's one service at 11 a.m. again next week. Uh, child care will not be available, but the nursery will be open. There's a live stream that's piped into there, so feel free to bring the whole family to that, and we'll look forward to worshiping again together in the new year. We have a soup Sunday coming up. We've started doing a monthly soup Sunday. The next one is January 8th. The last one we did went really well, so we're doing it again. Uh, we would like you to register on Eventbrite if possible so they know how much soup to make. Uh, which is really helpful. So if you can register yourself and your family on the Eventbrite using the QR code there or through the website, uh, we'd love to see you there. It's just a wonderful way to connect with uh, the church family, uh, share a meal together. Uh, so we'd love to see you there for that. Uh, Mike and Nikki Howell are Alliance International Workers to the country of Senegal. They're going to be with us as well on Sunday, January 8th. They're doing a bit of an open house uh, in the fireside room from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, so that's a great opportunity to get to know uh, them a bit more, find out uh, some of the ministries that they're a part of in Senegal, and just to offer our support to them as they're uh, back on home assignment. That's it for announcements this morning. I'll invite you to stand for the call to worship, which is from Isaiah and Revelation which says, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's sing together this morning, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Sing together. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight for all the earth. You who sang creation story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Yeah, 
creation, all creation, join in praising God the Father, Spirit, Son, evermore your praise. Sing the first new world. Sorry. What child is this? What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet? While shepherds watch our keeping, this, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to No well the angel did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night. No. 
Good morning and Merry Christmas. Let's join together in prayer this morning. Gracious Father, we praise you as the one who is abounding in love and faithfulness, and there is none like you. And as we celebrate this Christmas morning, we thank you for giving us the greatest gift of all, your son Jesus. I pray as we enjoy all of the good things that the season brings, the rest, the gatherings, the celebrations, Help us not to miss the reason for our celebrating. That is that you loved us so much that you sent your son to be born as a baby and eventually die to redeem us from our sin. And you did this, as Paul wrote, not because we deserved it, but because this was your plan from the beginning of time to show us your grace through Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So, Father, help our celebration of Christmas to be a celebration of your love for us, your love that isn't limited to our time on earth, but extends from eternity past when you formed your plan of redemption to eternity future when your people will be gathered around your throne. And may the truth of your love and grace humble and overwhelm us and fill us with joy and gratitude. And I pray this particularly for my brothers and sisters who are struggling this season with grief and with loneliness and with loss and hardship. Holy Spirit, would you bring comfort to their hearts through the knowledge that the eternal or eternal fellowship with the Father has been made possible because of the gracious sacrifice of Jesus the Son. And Father, your word says that nothing in creation, including our most personal thoughts and feelings, is hidden from your sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before you to whom we must give account. And so we confess our tendency to allow our love for you to grow cold, and we ask for your help in reviving our hearts. We haven't always been faithful in returning love to you or reflecting your love to others. We haven't always made time for prayer and fellowship with you, and we haven't always sought to serve and glorify you in all that we say and do. 
And at times we've turned to material and temporal things for comfort, fulfillment, and meaning. And we confess this as idolatry and, and ask for your forgiveness and your help to repent. And this Christmas, I ask that you would revive our love for you and give us the strength and ability to seek you daily and strive to glorify you in all that we say and do. And Father, as we approach the end of this year and look forward to a new year, help us in our hearts to continually set apart Christ as Lord. Free us from the worries and anxieties that we often allow to consume us and steal our peace in you. And in each circumstance, the highs and the lows, help us to trust you and to know the indescribable joy that Scripture says comes as the result of the salvation of our souls, the fruit of our faith in you. And I ask that you would protect us from the temptations and the attacks of the evil one and give us the strength and courage to stand firm in our faith in the places that you've called us to live and work. Help us to walk with you each day in humility and obedience and with faith that doesn't stray or falter. Help us to commit ourselves to prayer. Help us to anchor ourselves to Scripture and help us to continually trust in your provision for our daily needs. Father, this morning I, I pray for the children and the youth of our church, those blessings that you've given to us. And in the coming year, would you help them to grow in their knowledge and understanding of you, learning what it means to be filled with your Spirit and growing in them a desire to know you more. Stir within them also a desire to be transformed by your word. And Father, for those who are in need this morning of healing, we know that you are the great physician and that you have the power to heal and restore. I pray that you would bring clarity of thought to those struggling with issues of mental health. Father, for those facing physical sickness, comfort them with your presence and help them to renew their hope in you. Father, for our international workers, may they be renewed and refreshed by your spirit as well, particularly this Christmas season. Comfort those who are in the field and apart from family at this time. Bring them encouragement from your word and the fellowship of other believers near to them. Continue to give them opportunities to speak of Jesus often. And Father, for Pastor Jude as he preaches this morning, I pray that you would fill him with your spirit to speak with clarity and with a heart that is overflowing with love for you and for your people. God, I pray that you would use the words that he preaches to bring conviction and hope to all who hear. Stir in us a desire for greater conformity to your will. May all of us be drawn closer to you in worship and leave with a deeper desire to glorify you in all that we say and do. So, Father, we praise you for your great love and your grace, and we give you all the honor and the glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, it is a great privilege. It's a great privilege, at least to me, that Christmas Day falls on the Lord's Day and that we can be here together. As I sat at the front and watched my church family come in, as I stand up here and see you all out there, this is awesome. I hear kids making their noises. I love it. And so thank you. This is a great opportunity. And Lord willing... We'll see you all in 11 years when it happens again. <laughs> now, before I preach, I think we need to address the elephant in the room. Yes, I did get new sneakers for Christmas. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. It makes some of us older people feel really good when we can put something on from our childhood and it's considered cool. <laughs> and so I'm feeling good up here this morning for many reasons. In our short Christmas sermon series, we have considered a few things. The first sermon considered Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 and how those verses address in a roundabout way the coming of Jesus. And how God, by his Son, defeats despair, disrupts silence, and dispels darkness. Last night, from the same three verses, we considered how Jesus, fully God, fully divine, God the Son, came near. He came near to humanity. And he did so to reveal God 
to be crowned Messiah and fulfill the promise of God and to cleanse us from sin. And our series will finish this morning again by considering the same three verses from the first chapter of Hebrews as well as the addition of one verse from chapter 2. Recruiting chapter 2 was necessary. As we've seen, chapter 1 focuses on the divinity of Christ, whereas chapter 2 focuses on the humanity of Christ. And we can't consider the birth of Christ without looking at both Christ's divinity and his humanity. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And from the second chapter of Hebrews, verse 9, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We celebrate Christmas because Jesus, God the Son, became a man so that he might be our faithful representative who accomplishes salvation through his death on the cross. Let's start with a faithful representative. Jesus came. Jesus was born. He became a human so that he could represent humanity because our first representative failed. We jump right in to this second chapter of Hebrews and consider this verse that points to Jesus' incarnation, the one whom, through God, created the world, the one who is the radiance of the glory of God, the one who is the exact imprint of his nature, the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power, was, we are told, made a little lower than the angels. That is, he became a man. Now, we don't have time this morning to exposit all of chapter 2, but it is clear that the author of Hebrews in the second chapter is connecting Jesus becoming a man. He's connecting that to God's creation of the first man, Adam. Well, you'd have to think way back to when we started Hebrews, but in Hebrews chapter 2, the author quotes Psalm 8. And this psalm is a psalm which praises God for his creation generally. And a psalm that specifically alludes to the verse in Genesis which reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, Pastor Jude, we are here on this Christmas morning to consider Jesus, not Adam, but what we cannot miss this Christmas morning is that the author of Hebrews, in pointing to Jesus becoming a man, wants the reader to make a connection between Jesus and the first man, Adam. Now, that isn't clear in Hebrews 2. It certainly is clear in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21 and 22. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. All this is to say Jesus became a man in part. Jesus was born in part to be for us and to do for us what Adam failed to be and what Adam failed to do. Jesus is, if you will, the new, better, and last Adam. 
And that being the case, and since Scripture portrays Adam as mankind's representative, it follows that Jesus was born, Jesus became a man to be our representative, to represent us in a way that Adam didn't. Now the first Adam was made in God's image as the royal son of God, and he was commissioned as the representative of humanity to exercise wise, righteous, and holy dominion over this world, and having done that faithfully, he was to finish his work and to sit down enthroned in royal rest. We often forget about that. God had given the example, you work and then you rest. And Adam was called to work and to exercise dominion. And then it should have been followed by a rest. But clearly from the account of humanity's fall from grace in Genesis, Adam failed miserably. So, Jesus became a man that he might be a representative for mankind and be and do what Adam wasn't and didn't. Now, a wonderful example of our desire to have able, competent, successful representatives is experienced every year at this time for Canadians. The World Junior Hockey Tournament weighs heavy on the hearts of Canadians. I have to redeem myself from last night. I never should have used a soccer analogy. My apologies. I hope using a hockey illustration will help. The World Junior Hockey Tournament weighs heavy on the hearts of Canadians. Hockey is our sport. And these young athletes represent Canada on the global stage. And we yearn to be well represented. We want this team of hockey players to show the world on our behalf that we are still the world's hockey superpower. Their successes become our successes. Their failures are our failures. Well, in an infinitely more important way, Jesus became a man that he might faithfully represent us where Adam failed to do the same. Where Adam was found lacking, Christ was found faithful. Jesus showed himself to be a faithful royal son, a faithful representative who, as we will see in this next point, not only freed us from sin in his faithfulness, but also entered into his royal rest at God's right hand. That is, he rested after his work because his work was successful. Point number two, an accomplished salvation. God the Son became a man to accomplish salvation. Now, on May 6th of 2023, Lord willing... The world will witness an event which hasn't occurred in 70 years. The world will witness the coronation of a royal sovereign of Britain. In May of next year, King Charles III will be crowned and will be seated on his throne in Westminster Abbey. King Charles will be crowned with the solid gold 17th century St. Edward's crown. And he will be presented with items, including the royal orb, representing his religious and moral authority, and the sovereign scepter, a symbol of power. It's a, a gold rod topped with a white enameled dove, also a symbol of justice and mercy. And he will sit on the royal throne. And all of these things symbolically indicate what is already true of Charles. He is the king. Well, in a similar way, Jesus' enthronement and Jesus' coronation are recognition of who Jesus is. He is the representative of men who successfully accomplished salvation. And that's why we read in Hebrews, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. We see him crowned with glory and honor. 
Because Jesus is the royal son who faithfully finished his work. And so he now sits enthroned and crowned at God's right hand, crowned with glory and honor. And so Jesus became a man. Jesus was born that he might accomplish salvation. Jesus, as our representative, succeeded on behalf of mankind where Adam failed. We see this in Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 12 through 19 so we can see how Jesus is our representative and how he accomplished salvation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, So, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Not only do these verses make it clear that Jesus became a man to be our representative, and as our representative to accomplish salvation, they also lead us into our next point by explaining exactly how Jesus represented us and how he accomplished salvation. My last point this morning, a death On a cross, Jesus became a man. Jesus was born to die for us. This is the startling truth, the startling startling reality about Christmas. Jesus became a man. Jesus was born to die. Now, his conception and his birth can be seen as the first earthly step on a journey with momentous results. Who would have fathomed on that first Christmas morn, other than God, that the birth of this boy to a meek mother, the birth of this boy into a rather insubstantial family would lead to a death on a cross with unmatched consequences. The epic story told by J.R.R. Tolkien concerning the events of Middle Earth involving hobbits and elves and dwarves and men had a humble beginning. This heroic fantasy which resulted in the peoples of Middle Earth being freed from the oppression of a malicious evil and being saved from a future of misery and darkness. It is understood in many ways to have been set in motion by the first step of a seemingly insignificant hobbit. Bilbo Baggins, in The Hobbit, initiated the events that would culminate in this beautiful story of victory, of good over evil. Bilbo's nephew Frodo, the protagonist in the much larger Lord of the Rings, would explain all of this in remembering something his uncle Bilbo said to him. Frodo, at the start of his own epic journey, journey, remembered the words of his uncle. He often used to say that there was only one road, that it was like a great river, its springs were at every doorstep and every path was its tributary. It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out of your door, he used to say. You step into the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there is no telling where you might be swept swept off to. Well, Bilbo stepped out of his hobbit hole on that fateful day 
And that was the humble beginnings of a great work of salvation in the story, Lord of Rings. Well, the Christmas story, what we celebrate on Christmas Day, the one that's conveyed in the Gospels, is the humble first step in the realm of humanity. The humble first step of an epic journey of mankind's hero, wherein he would die to save us. Jesus became a man that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. The message of Christmas is not just about the baby born in the manger. It's not less than that, but it's certainly more than that. It's a message of a baby who would become a man A baby who would represent all of mankind. A baby who would accomplish salvation, not through his birth per se, but through his death. The message of Christmas is the message of this baby boy. It's a message that if you put your faith in, you will experience that salvation. Will you this morning? Put your faith in that baby boy who became a man, who represented us, who accomplished salvation through his death on the cross. I encourage you to this morning. Let me finish by quoting Canadian theologian Stephen Wellam, who in his book, The Person of Christ, sums all of this up so well. He writes, Our Savior and Redeemer is unique in both who he is and what he does. In fact, because sin makes our plight so desperate, the only person who can save us is God's own dear Son. It's only as the Son incarnate that our Lord can represent us, pay for our sin, and stand in our place. Only Jesus can satisfy God's righteous demands against us, since he is one with the Lord as God the Son. Only Jesus can do this for us because he is truly a man and can represent us. Representation requires identification. And in all these ways, our Lord is perfectly suited to meet our every need. Without the incarnation and Christ's entire obedient work, there is no salvation for us. But Christ did become a man. He did take on flesh. He did live a life of perfect obedience. And so there is salvation for us. That's the Christmas story. And so our application this morning, and I end with this, our application this Christmas morning is the same thing that it was last night. Let us wonder and worship Jesus. Let us wonder and worship that God became a man to be our representative, to accomplish our salvation, to die on a cross for his people. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Let's pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together on this holiday And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that God became man, that he took on flesh, and he became for us a faithful representative. And that as our representative, he accomplished what our first representative couldn't and didn't. He accomplished our salvation. And we acknowledge this morning that not with the physical eyes, but with the eyes of our heart, we see him crowned with glory and honor. And we know this is the case. Even as we celebrate his birth, we know this is the case because he died for us. And I pray that that glorious Christmas message would resonate in our hearts this Christmas season and that would carry over into the new year And that 2023 would be a year in which we glory in our Savior more and more. We ask this in his name. Amen.
I'll invite you to stand and we'll respond to those truths that we've just heard singing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. singing the joy to the world. Thank you. 
joyful sound. Hear the joyful sound of a offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name. You rule the world. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working on us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom. Christmas. Christmas. 